Hello and welcome to the Friday, August 25th, 2017 edition of the Sands Internet Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Virginia Beach, Virginia. HP Enterprise's integrated lights out cards are certainly not a stranger to critical vulnerabilities and we have yet another critical vulnerability that you should patch as soon as possible. It does allow for authentication bypass as well as for arbitrary code execution on the card. These are the cards that you typically use to remotely manage servers semi out of band, which sometimes means that these cards are actually exposed to regain access to systems which turn out to be otherwise unreachable. And Kaspersky is reporting about malicious Facebook messages that are advertising websites that will spread malware. Now, the way this starts out is that you will receive a message from a friend of yours via Facebook that contains a link to what looks like a movie. Now, when you click on that link, it actually will pop up something movie-like and it sort of almost makes it look like it's part of the Facebook page. You probably have seen it where a video essentially takes up the entire page and puts the actual Facebook page in the background. The only twist here is that then a pop-up will instruct you to download a video player or an update for your flash player. That of course then turns out to be malicious. Now this is done pretty well even to the point where they are displaying different messages for Windows versus Mac users in order to cover different operating systems. Many of the links that Kaspersky observed just lead to spam, so actually the monetization here, maybe we are just selling spam ad impressions. And a researcher at mobile security company Symperium did release an exploit for a vulnerability that was patched in May with iOS 10.3.2. So this particular exploit will work for 10.3.1 and earlier. It's a full working kernel exploit that was released. So it does include a sandbox escape, which is always critical for these iOS exploits. It could potentially be used in a jailbreak exploit, but as is stated by this researcher, by itself, uh, this particular exploit won't jailbreak your phone. And apparently Samsung managed to release a bad update for the software for some of its Mu series TVs. And now at this point it looks like mainly users in the United Kingdom are affected by this problem after the update is applied and the TV is rebooted. It will either get stuck at the logo or you'll just see a black screen. Now various bulletin boards have posts from Anchor users going back to last weekend. They were told initially that Samsung would release another update within about 48 hours, but up to this point apparently nothing has been released yet. Some users have apparently been told by Samsung support that in order to fix the problem, an engineer has to visit their house in order to apply an update in person, so not clear why this can't be done by the user itself, whether there's some special equipment needed in order to perform the update. But this is yet another problem with these automated updates for Internet of Things devices. Where of course in particular these devices have probably the most to gain from automated updates because users are less likely going to apply updates manually to them. Hello, it's Friday again, and uh, today we actually don't have an STI student. Instead, uh, we'll try something different uh, where I'll interview some of our Internet Storm Center handlers. And today I have John Bamanek uh, with you. John, you have been with the Internet Storm Center for quite a while now, I think. Uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Yeah, no, I think I was with the Internet Storm Center almost from the beginning. So my name's John Bambanek. Uh, you know, professionally, I, uh, I'm a manager of threat systems uh, at Fidelis Cybersecurity. I also teach uh, computer science and information science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign uh, and obviously do some side consulting on top of uh, being affiliated here with SANS and the uh, Internet Storm Center. 
Now, one of these sort of open source projects uh, that you have been running for quite a while is uh, the DGA list, the domain generation list, uh, where basically you're looking at some of the malware, mm -hmm. some of the domain name generation algorithms and uh, list some of the domain names that people sort of can use as indicators of compromise. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that list and uh, how it sort of fits in? Sure. Uh, about 2013, uh, I started a working group dealing with CryptoLocker, which is kind of the first mainstream cryptographic ransomware that we saw that was ultimately taken down for uh, with Operation Tovar and led to the indictment of uh, Bogachev. But part of that is trying to figure out, hey, we need to know where these guys are registering domains so that we can let law enforcement in the appropriate country seize them and put wires on them because they were reverse proxies. So they'd only be up for a few days and then they go down again. In order to figure out what was behind that, we really needed to be very quick about saying, oh, by the way, this proxy service just popped up in Germany or Mexico or, or wherever. So what I did with that DGA is uh, the uh, domain generation algorithm was reverse engineered into Perl, I think is, is what that one is, and just did all of the domains that were valid from two days ago to three days in the future, and then just bulk resolve them all uh, with asynchronous DNS or ADNS tools uh, if you use uh, Debian packaging. Uh, and from there it says, okay, here are all IP addresses that are resolving for that and strip out some whitelists. Uh, after we took that down, I said, you know, this is really useful. Let's do it with more families. And now there's about four dozen families we're doing that with uh, where it's basically giving real-time resolution. So there's, there's a variety of things you can do with it. Uh, one, I produce one feed that just says all the valid domains in that one week window. You can feed that into RPZ or response policy zone and just proactively block it. So if somebody clicks on something, somehow malware gets into your network, boom, uh, it can never reach out to the DGA domains. It's important to realize there might be Tor or other things behind it uh, and multiple kind of fallback mechanisms, but it also is very good for detecting uh, evidence of compromise. Uh, and some of those resolutions provide some interesting intelligence. I tell people to, to be wary about piping that right into a firewall because these domains are in the control of the adversary, right? They can resolve it to 8.8.8.8 if they wanted to, just to mess with your firewall, and they have done that over the years. But uh, I continue adding more uh, DGA seeds and families, uh, working on creating um, uh, an open uh, response policy zone uh, that people can get, and really trying to get that in the hands of ISPs and consumer organizations, because a lot of what security companies and professionals do are protecting enterprises. There isn't much in the consumer space, so if Comcast or Cox or uh, whoever have this, they can provide some measure of protection from consumers ag against these threats, which many are like ransomware is directed truly at the consumer user, not at the enterprise. So anybody can download that? Any restrictions sort of on the license for the data? No, uh, there's thousands of people using it directly. The uh, the only restriction, and it's a soft restriction, it, it's open database. If you want to commercialize it, that's fine. But if you commercialize it, uh, I actually run a charity. I try to build schools in Africa. So if you're a security company who's selling this or making it part of your product, I ask for uh, a donation to uh, help me build schools in Africa. But other than that, it's it's free for all, uh, and it, uh, it'll never be commercialized in part because I've gotten a lot of help from others and uh, I there's no good way to remunerate them for for the work they've put into it it may have my name on it but you know there's been a dozen people helping in a variety of ways and I'm not gonna monetize somebody else's work yeah, and we'll add uh, some of the URLs uh, to the show notes so people uh, can find uh, these mm -hmm. lists if they're interested now uh, this is really sort of something that uh, comes back to you know what Internet Storm Center the shield what we have been doing over the last mm -hmm. uh, 15 plus years is sort of all about that we have all these people that really help us out uh, try to make the internet a better place what got you sort of interested in internet storms and becoming a handler originally do you remember it was probably way back <laughs> <laughs> it's about 15 years ago um uh, you know i think ultimately it kind of comes down to what you touched on is is yeah, helping enterprises and making products is how I feed my family, you know, but at the end of the day, we all have a lot of skills uh, that we can contribute some measure of time to, to, like I said, try to solve problems. Like I said, I create some open source feeds that basically I give away. Uh, I help law enforcement from time to time to, to try to prosecute bad people. 
um, you know, try to get information out there to uh, disrupt or at least help mitigate what the bad guys are doing. Because uh, at the end of the day, there's so few of us, um, you know, defenders, uh, and there's a whole lot of criminals out there who are exploiting all the time. And, uh, you know, I think throwing some measure of our time to pro bono work uh, is what you really should be doing kind of as a professional life. Lawyers do it. Doctors do it. Uh, I think computer security professionals should uh, give some measure of their talent to try to, to help clean things up uh, in, in whatever way they can. Now, any particular thing you're working on next? Kind of what are you sort of going for uh, with these lists? Any additional malware families you're adding or... I, I, I'm always adding malware families as I reverse engineer them or get code from others. I think I've got a, a backlog of maybe six families uh, since I do it in my spare time. I, I can't do it as often or as much as I'd like, uh, but I'm always trying to pick up other projects along the way. I mean, you know, the DGA surveillance stuff is interesting. Um, I also like what uh, Shodan is doing for looking for remote access tools and C2s. I mean, they're scanning the Internet all the time, so now they're looking for, for that. Uh, I want to start trying to enable that maybe because uh, there's a lot of remote access tool research that I've done. But to really get to the point of, uh, of developing things where, you know, bad guy puts something on the Internet, we find it, we're already proactively blocking it to really make their time to exist as small as possible. Any rough idea how much data you're actually offering these days, like how many entries or kilobytes, megabytes, or? Um, uh, I, the, the full list of DGA, uh, DGA domains is about a million entries. Uh, I actually put it behind Cloudflare in a caching service because it's, it's running in Amazon, and the bandwidth charges were running upwards of 500 a month. So just for the bandwidth, not even the instance. Um, so I want to say, uh, I actually, I don't even know what the size, size of it is, but it's a million domains, and then somewhere on the order of 500 some odd uh, are resolving but not whitelisted for whatever reason. Yeah, so that's a real neat project there. Uh, thank you, John, for joining me here uh, for uh, this uh, Friday interview and uh, talk to you again on Monday. Bye.